glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In, so there are five books of the Torah, which the law gave, and there are five books of the Psalms. Five is a wonderful number because five is the number of four plus one. Um, so it, the weak is seen with the strong. The creator is now seen with the creature. So four is the number of weakness, but only so that we will come to God for his strength. And there are 150 Psalms. So you can see three times five, um, 15 multiplied by 10 is 150. So that's a very good place to start, would you say? That there is, there are Bibles um, that are just concentrating through um, the, the Jewish, uh, the rabbis, and uh, through the ancient men and women of God who can see how numbers keep appearing in pattern and design. And there's, they're not random, but they are in perfect order. And um, I just wanted to, to show you tonight that if we look at the front of these wonderful Bibles where it says the Psalms, which in Hebrew, the word is the praises, the praises, hallelujah, the praises. But you know, um, there is no a child's place with the father found in the Psalms. And when you get to this fourth paragraph here, the collection is arranged in how many books? Five. Five books. So we've got book one, which is Psalms 1 to 41, and that is, you can help me along, Genesis. And then you've got book two, which is Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the waters, or Psalm 72, is the book in the wilderness because the deer is panting for water, because he's thirsting in the wilderness. And then book three, the numbers book, is 73 to 89. Book four is Psalm, no, that's sorry. <laughs> book three is Leviticus. It is the shortest one. It's where we find the holiness of the sanctuary. Book four is numbers because it begins at Psalm 90. And Moses is seeing people dying in the wilderness. And he writes that psalm about the age of man returning to dust. He's the first man. Psalm 91 is the one who shadows under the wings of the Most High God. And that is the new man, the man in Christ. And then you've got book five, which is Psalm 107 to Psalm 150. How many times have you read that and looked at it and thought? How many people read their books, for, read their Bibles for years without realizing there's a mirror book of the Genesis with the Psalms. We've all done it, haven't we? And it takes someone to, to show you um, somehow that there is great treasure to be found. And as we said while we were on holiday a couple of weeks ago, our Father God in heaven does not hide anything from us. He hides things for us so that we can purify our ways by seeking and finding and searching and digging and looking. And when we're looking for truth, we're not looking for anything else, are we? Okay. So Psalm 1, as, a, as you can see, is uh, book 1. Turn the page over. It's Psalm 1. And when I just want to show you some other things. Psalm 1 to 8 is one section. And the reason being... And this is what we were talking about in pattern. Where does it start and where does it finish? Well, we can clearly see in Psalm chapter 1, there is a tree in verse 3 firmly planted by streams of water. Yeah. There is no name to this tree, but fruitfulness in its season is its description. This is because we are united to the blessed man in verse 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scorners. But his delight is in the law. So we're on Jewish ground here. We're not this, this five books of the Psalms does not cover the mystery of the church. 
or the grace dispensation. It covers ultimately the remnant of Israel and the glorious coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that we have just sang about. So when we get to here, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Okay, now if you just want to go for a moment there, well, to verse, to chapter 3. Chapter 3, I'll give you some uh, headings just to put, is what's known as a morning. Chapter 3 is a morning. Uh, Psalm 3 is a morning. Psalm 5 is seen as an evening. Are the days on the earth going to get better? No, they are not. They're going to get darker and they're going to get worse. So we've got a morning depicted in Psalm 3. We've got an evening scene. The heading of Psalm 5 is prayer for protection from the wicked. Now, that uh, there is seen as the evening. Interestingly, there are 12 verses in this psalm. Can you see? 1 to 12. And as I was saying in the week, 12, this is absolutely the entirety. This one is basically the entirety of an antichrist satanic government. It's all got to come to the fullness of evil in the day that we have been chosen to live. Our only hope is that we'll be taken in the rapture, that it is where we are going to be, harpezoed, when we do not know. But when we look at these psalms, we keep seeing this perfect order. So we've got 12 verses in this psalm. Then you get to ver Psalm 7, that is known as the night. Can you see the process? We've gone morning, evening, still a bit of light, night. And in the night... The heading of Psalm 7 is, the Lord implored to defend the psalmist against the wicked. And this is to do, look, uh, um, here. A shigion of David, type of Christ, which he sang to the Lord concerning Cush, a Benjamite. Remember Cush, the Benjamite was connected with the very unhappy Saul in David's day. So when we go back for a moment, to, if you just go with me to Genesis chapter 10 for a moment, please, we can see very clearly, you know, that beautiful music starts and, and heads up to this wonderful crescendo. And then there's a kind of uh, little adagietto at the end. And all of these Psalms keep heading up, but they never go further than the millennial God, most high God, being identified with his people. The rest is never spoken about in Psalms. But if we have a look in uh, descent, uh, chapter 10 of, of Genesis, verse 6, we can clearly see here, and the sons of Ham, remember they called him Black Ham, were Cush and Mizraim and Put and Canaan. And the sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabtar, Ramar, Sabtaka, and the sons of Ramar were Sheba and Dedan. Now, Cush, can you see why it's evening? Night. Cush became the father of Nimrod, whose name in Hebrew means rebel. Rebelling, ultimately, the whole world will be as the Cushite. Rebelling against, we don't want any king to rule over us. The mind of a beast will be given the government. And as we said before, when we looked this week at um, Ahaz, he was not a fanatic. He was a diplomat. It's the white horse going out. A bow, but no arrows. Verse 8, Cush became the father of Nimrod, whose name means rebel, he became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before or in place of the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And then we go back to Psalm chapter 7. And we can see now in these first eight 
there's an order. So we've got the morning, the evening, the night, and the night is very dark. And it's the night of the Cushite, ultimate rebellion, Nimrod. But can you see the last verse of Psalm 7? Would you like to read it with me? Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, it's just so wonderful. This is the judgment on the Cushite, the, the Antichrist spirit, the first Antichrist, Nimrod. Look at verse 15. Should we read 15 to 17, please? He has dug a pit and hollowed it out and has fallen into the hole which he made. What does that make you shout? Hallelujah. 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 He, Nimrod, the mighty hunter, hunting for the souls of men, is finally going to be dealt a blow. Yes, that psalm is called night. But you see, it's night just before the dawn, isn't it? The light is coming. And look at the description. He's dug a pit, hollowed it out, fallen into the hole which he made. How are we doing there, Carol? Okay, darling. Okay, now it's verse 16. His mischief. You see, his mischief today is to cause you to doubt God. Whatever is not of faith is sin. We've got to believe God is on our side always, forever. He never tires of us. His mercy and his compassion is new every moment of our lives. The mischief of the enemy is to cause you to doubt that you are the most precious being on this earth. C.S. Lewis said, you look at every human being and see them either as the most despicable, dark, God-forsaken creature in hell for eternity or the most beautiful being that you could ever see on earth because the glory of God is within. That's how we're to see each other. And even tonight, it's so wonderful to see you all here and to know there's only one heart that's beating together and it's for Jesus. Amen. He's alive. He's alive. He's keeping us alive Amen. in his strength, by his power, in his delight. But the Jews' delight today is still getting the law right. It's not about the mystery of the Christian. So shall we go back to verse 16? His mischief, Kelly, will return upon his own head. His violence will descend upon his own pit, which is head. Uh, and then here it is. This is the end of the tribulation. I will give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. That's his, you got it, Rodney. That's his millennial name has come forth at the end of the enemy's mischief coming upon his own head, which is the Antichrist, which is a Cushite, which is what David's enemies were. Enemies, Saul, the flesh. Now, number eight, would you say, is resurrection, new beginnings. And this day is called full day, full day. You've got a morning, you've got an evening, you've got a night that finishes in spiritual completion of the darkness because the mischief returned upon the head of the Antichrist who's got his th three and a half years, 42 months still to be had, still to be had in Jerusalem. So now you've got a new beginning. Can you see that order? Amen. Yeah. So you've got, even, you've got morning, evening, night, full day. The evening brings about, look at this, the, the end of the night is, he's dug a big pit, he hollowed it out in verse 15, and he's fallen into the hole which he made. Now, just go for a moment, please. Isaiah 30. I can see these words coming up before your minds right now. Have a look at this. Have a look at this. In other words, Julie, he sealed his own demise. Yes, he has. And every time he attacks you, he says the enemy in Deuteronomy 28 might come in one direction, but will have to flee in seven. Disintegrate, splinter, desiccate yourself, disappear. I'm here to live for Jesus. There's more truth that you've just heard tonight than you will from any wedding tomorrow, 
No one will ever know why that poor girl's father isn't there and our hearts feel for her. Nobody, but Jesus knows. Amen. Nobody knows the ramifications of Mr. Donald Trump and, and what's taking place and the embassies in Jerusalem and what's honest and what's lie and the Palestinian issue that we all know about. But God, God does. And this is Amen. an order. Are you fortified in your heart that all is well, it's been written. No, no word will ever change of this wonderful word. It has all been established in righteousness. Now, if when you get to Isaiah 30, just above verse 18, what does it say? God is gracious and just. And we're going to read. Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Now we're talking about here, Israel. Therefore, he waits on high. He's waiting to have compassion on you whilst the church is on the earth. Yes. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. Well, we've longed for him and found him. Israel's got to long for him and find him. Because he says, oh, people in Zion, inhabit, uh, inhabitant in Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. What is the sound of Israel, the remnant's cry? Isaiah 53. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. Although the Lord has given you bread of privation, and water of oppression, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself. But your eyes will behold your teacher. You see, that the privation is during the tribulation. Morning, evening, night. Full day. Okay, you can see. Full day. You got it. You've got it. Got it. Your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or to the left, you will defile your graven images overlaid with silver, your molten images plated with gold. You will scatter them as an impure thing and say to them, Be gone. You know, when Sarah went into those houses today or yesterday with the Shivas and the Buddhas and, you know, all these people that you meet um, in the corporate world and they get onto your Facebook page and they've got a new rest and tranquil garden with the ugliest Shiva you've ever seen in the world. I think of this verse, the day will come when people of wisdom will shout, be gone, be gone. Well, Christ said, be gone to those lying spirits at Calvary. Christ said, be gone, be gone, death, be swallowed up in my victory. Here we go, 23. Then he will give you rain for the seed which you will sow in the ground and bread from the yield of the ground, and it will be rich and plenteous on that day. Your livestock will graze in a roomy pasture. Isn't that wonderful, oh Israel? A roomy pasture. They're not defi <laughs> There's no roomy pasture for Israel today. They are on every side waiting to be pushed into the sea. Roomy pasture. Also, the oxen and the donkeys which work the ground will eat salted fodder, which has been winnowed with shovel and fork. Here we go. Every lofty mountain and on every high hill, there will be streams running with water on the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. And here he is. And the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun. And the light of the sun will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven. He's the seventh day Sabbath. He's come in all his glory to bring his joy of rest. And because Israel received him as Messiah, the Gentile nations also received that rest. Yes. On the day the Lord binds up the fracture of his people and heals the bruise, he has afflicted. Now look at this. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from a remote place. Burning is his anger. Dense is his smoke. His lips are filled with indignation. His tongue are like a consuming fire. His breath is like an overflowing torrent which reaches to the neck to shake the nations back and forth in a sieve and to put the jaws of the people's the bridle which leads to ruin. Sorry. You will have songs as in the night when you keep the festival. Gladness of heart as when one marches to the sound of the flute. Now we're going to look in a minute how one of these psalms is to the sound of the flute. But the sound of the flute, it says, go one octave lower. You're just about to hit rock bottom, Israel. 
The very psalm that says, play it one octave lower, shows the rock bottom state of Israel. How does that make you feel tonight? Is anybody in your heart saying, forgive me, Lord, when I do not trust you? I must be the only one. To, this, to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel, and the Lord will cause his voice of authority to be heard, and the descending of his arm to be seen in fierce anger, and in the flame of a consuming fire, in cloud bursts, downpour, and hailstones. Here we go. For at the voice of the Lord, Assyria, that's the last enemy, Assyria is Syria. Assyria will be terrified when he strikes him with the rod. Every blow of the rod of punishment which the Lord will lay on him will be with the music of tambourines and lyres. And in battles brandishing weapons, he will fight them. Here he comes. For Topeth has long been ready. It has been prepared for the king. He has made it deep and large, a pyre of fire with plenty of wood. The breath of the Lord, like a torrent of brimstone, sets it afire. Mm. You see, <laughs> dig it deep, dig it wide. Let's go back, please, to Psalm 7. The end of Psalm 7, all again in Isaiah, all the way through, we've got the same theme lifting up and then it stops again and you go back retrospectively, you start again. So we have gone right through Psalm 7. We have looked at the pit being dug, which is again described in Isaiah chapter 30. <clears throat> the end of uh, Psalm 7, they recognize who the Lord most high is. He's the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. So now we come to Psalm 8. Are you with me, Rodney? Yeah. You, you can see the order. You can, because after the night, what does the night finish with? It's here, the heading for the choir director on the, the Gittith, a Psalm of David. And what does it say? This is a new beginning and it's the end of the night. It's the full day. And what's the first verse say? Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in, in all the earth. Who has displayed thy splendor above the heavens? From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, thou hast established strength. Because of thine adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. Then he goes, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou dost take thought of him, and the son of man that thou dost care for him? Yet thou hast made him a little lower than God, and dost crown him with glory and majesty. Thou dost make him to rule over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. That is the end of the first section. We've gone from a, a picture of Christ planted by the water, delighting in the Lord, delighting in the Lord. It's a picture of the remnant of Israel. From there, you head up right to the end of Psalm 8. But you can clearly see, can't you hear, how wonderful that order is. Eight there. Now, if we just go back for a moment, please. Uh, when you get to, I just want you to go to um, 1 Samuel 17, verse 4. 1 Samuel 17, verse 4, which we all know is the, hallelujah, it's the David. It's the David because we're looking at the word gitteth, and we all know that the word gitteth in Hebrew is the wine press. So would you agree that at the end of the tribulation finishes with the wrath of God, with the wine press, with the treading out of the grapes. Would you say that, Rodney? Yeah. Wine press. The wine press is an aut autumnal song chanted by the vine dressers at the joyful vintage season, but not until the blood of the grape has been poured out. It is Jesus. 
He is our Gittith. He is truly. He's trod the wine press alone, hasn't he? We know that, don't we, in um, Isaiah 63. So here we go. There are two schools of thought um, of uh, Gittith and wine press. Um, and we see the uh, idea of it in uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse 1 to 4. Who would have to come from Gath, meaning the wine press as well? It would have to be no other than the enemy of all men, the enemy of Israel, is Goliath. So what's David thinking about when he's writing Psalm 8? He's remembering the great victory when he picked up those five smooth stones. Mm -hmm. Five, the number of law, but really he only had to throw one. So weak creation is united with the oneness of the smooth stone to become finding grace. Okay, so shall we start off? Seven, 1 Samuel 17, verses 1 to 4. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Socho, which means a hedge or a fence or a fortification. You see, when we battle the enemy, we've got a hedge, we've got a fence, we've got a fortification. It is the blood, the blood, the wonderful blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a hedge when you are praying, when you are seeing people released from demons, you know there's a hedge. There's something that stops any more attack of the enemy. I've got a protection. I've got an authority, a Socho, which belongs to Judah. And they camp between Socho and Azakar in Ephes Damim. And we all know what Ephes Damim is. It's the boundary of the blood. Boundary of the blood, yes. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah. Now, Elah means, some commentators say, the mighty one, Elah, and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. Our valley of Elah is Calvary. Amen. Our smooth stone is Jesus Christ. The Goliath that was killed at Calvary was my death and yours. Amen. Death is gone. Death has been swallowed up. Victory. Hallelujah. We shall never die. I was only talking to Pat about you. You're a miracle, Sheila. You and her are miracles to me. And you'll never die. Miracles. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. But the valley was between them. Well, the valley is the cross. Between me and every bloodthirsty enemy, there's a valley. There's a place where that enemy has to go down. Happy to go into the valley because the cross is there. Yeah. He ministers to us when we're weak. You know, the blind stones, if I remember right, you said it's a picture of the Armageddon. It's like, because it is. this is where Jesus said, this is as far as you go. Yes. In the words, you it, shall not, not pass. That's exactly it. Exactly it. Because here you see it in verse 4. Then a champion... You see, T, what is your champion tonight? Came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath. His name in Hebrew means banishment and exile. I'll banish you from the presence of God. You'll be in exile from where the blood has dealt for you. So Goliath there is to keep us banished and exiled from the presence and the nearness of God. But Goliath is from Gath, which is the wine press. So when David's speaking in Psalm 8, he's very intimate with Gath. He defeated him. He defeated the one who wanted to banish him from the presence of God with that smooth stone out of the brook, whose height was six cubits and a span. I just want you to turn the page over. Well, actually, you'll have to go two pages over. We know that David defeated this is actually all in um, these notes here. Um, I just wanted to... Yeah. When David was the champion for Israel, for, for the men, Jesus will be the champion in the Armageddon War. Because, he's, all will see that he is the because he is the stone of Israel. Yes. That's right. And he's coming to the wine press. Amen. And he's trod the wine press alone. But there's a wonderful piece here. No, I don't need to say sorry. Here we go. His head's come off. Okay? Should we start at 46? Start at 45 of 1 Samuel 17. 
David is the man who wrote Psalm 8. After the evening that's coming for Israel, the true David is coming in the wine press. Just before we read that, just go again to Isaiah 63. I think it's verse 4, please. Isaiah 63. Here he is. It's verse 2. Our David truly is, as you say it. Our David in type is Jesus Christ in antitype. He's the only one who can defeat the one who defies the armies of Israel. Okay. That's right. And it has to come from under a brook because it's a type of death. Under the water is death. The smooth stones. He has to take something from his death to defeat your death and mine. Hallelujah. But he is known as the smooth stone of Israel. Chapter 63, verse 1. We've read this millions of times. <clears throat> Isaiah is speaking prophetically. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Bosra, the sheepfold? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching, inclining in the greatness of his strength. And he says... Uh, Isaiah goes, who is it? And Jesus says, it, it is I who speak. In, it's me. It's the one who took your death. He's speaking to me every night. I took your death, Julie Eden saw. I saw you die. That's the first death I think is more painful than when we finally just are released from this. It is I who speak in righteousness. And then he says, who is this? He goes, it is I who speak in righteousness, comma, mighty to save. Amen. Mighty to save. Hallelujah. Why he's speaking again is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads the wine press. Think of Goliath. Think of Gath. Think of Gitteth. Think of wine press. Think of the end of that night for the full day. And then he says, I have trodden the wine trough alone. Hallelujah. And from the, yes, and from the peoples, there was no man with me. No one else is worthy of the glory. Jesus Christ alone trod the wine trough. The grape was squeezed at Calvary and his blood was shed for you, you and for me. Yeah. Oh, I'm from the, the, no one else can receive the glory. There. And from the peoples, there was no man with me. He didn't need any man to be with him. On, a, on his own, he was going to vanquish sin and death. I also trod them in my anger, trampled them in my wrath. Think of banishment and exile of Goliath. Think of the wrath. And their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment, for the day of vengeance was in my heart. You see, the day of vengeance was in the heart in Psalm 7, the night of tribulation. You see, there's going to be a separation. The godly will be separated from the ungodly because their desire will have been seen during the 42 months. The godly's desire for Christ, the Messiah, We'll, the separation will come by the godly. And the, the, my year of redemption has come. I looked and there was no one to help. This is the anguish of the heart. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I looked and there was no one to help. I was astonished. There was no one to uphold. Here he is. This great arm of the Lord. My own arm. My own arm brought salvation to me. My wrath upheld me, and I trod down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their life blood on the earth. Not because he wants to. It's not the will of the Father. He wants people to come to him and walk in his counsel. That's what Psalm 1 is about. There's counsel without God in 2018. There's Christian psychologists and Christian therapists and Christian ministers who give counsel without God. All we're doing tonight is giving God's, God's word. Amen. God's word. Amen. But look at this. 
when you go, we're starting, aren't we? Sorry. Verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, who is, what's that name mean? It's the remnant of Israel at the end. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This is history, but it's prophetic. It is history with prophecy. And he says, this day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. We think of all the, yeah, the birds and everything in the battle of Armageddon and all And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Then it happened when the Philistine rose, Goliath, banishment, exile. He kept us banished and exile. He kept me banished and exile from God for 29 years. It happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag, took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Just go back to Psalm to verse 40. See his, where are you, Carol? Verse 40 is the previous page. Verse 40. So you need to turn your page over, sweetheart. So David took his stick in his hand, chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even in his pouch, and his sling was in his hand. And he approached something that came from death. He approached the Philistine. But interestingly, just go to 512 for the word smooth in the back of your Bible, please. 2512. 2512. Changes it completely. 2512. It's the word, I think it's car, car look. Car look means smooth. Can you see that? Page 2,491, 2,515, 2,512, from 2,504, 2,505. Can you see, Carl, look at the top, the primitive root? Look what it says, 2,505. This is where we get the word for smooth stone. To be smooth, figuratively, By implication, smooth, read it with me, please. Smooth stones were used for lots to apportion or separate, to deal, distribute, divide, flatter, give, have, whatever. Take away a portion, receive, separate. Isn't this is a separation between the living and the dead? Death, you're about to die. And I tell you, I've been saved for 36 years and I know so many people every day live in fear. Would you agree? Do you, Kelly? You do. I can see it on your face. But when you look into the word, my meditation upon him shall be sweet. He took your death. You're never going to die. So you have to come and say, I live in fear of death, Julie. Will you help me? Yes. This is helping you. He's picked that smooth stone up from underneath the water, which which means death, to separate. You're no longer dead. We have not got death awaiting us. We've got life. Life as God intended awaiting us. Would you agree? Pardon? You can pick your own smooth stone next year and put it in your bag. But this is what? He takes this stone, go back to 49. Go back to 49, please, everybody. Verse chapter, chapter 50, yeah, verse 50. 
And now if you're wondering what this has got to do with Psalm 8, it's because the Gittith, it is Psalm 1 Samuel 17 verse 15. See, David writing the Psalm has already defeated David. He's already defeated Goliath. He's, already, he's prophetic. I was, I am, but Christ is the real me. Christ, in a sense, is coming. He's defeated death. Now he's defeated it for the Christians. He's got to defeat the death of the nation of Israel. And they've got to call out to him. Have a look at this, verse 50. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a smooth stone. He struck the Philistine, here we go, and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Hallelujah. David ran, stood over the Philistine, took his, he took his death. He took the ability to kill him. And people don't realize you're in habits year after year. Miserable, grumpy people, frightened people, people who can't go an extra mile because you don't see. The blow that Satan wanted to give you was taken by Jesus Christ. And he took the sword, he took his sword, drew it out of his sheath and killed the very one who wanted to kill him. And he cut off his head with it. I'm no longer thinking like the devil. I'm no longer thinking fearfully. I'm no longer, fe th I'm no longer thinking, oh my word, do I really want to continue this difficult life? Life is getting more difficult every day. Would you agree? Yeah. Us in Cherishers have had an absolutely difficult, difficult week. We've been praised in front of 15 social workers who think we are utterly insane. That was on Monday morning, which was a really good start. And then it's blow by blow by blow by blow by blow. What would you say with me, Sarah? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. He can't leave us the same. These trials cannot leave us the same. David ran quickly. Do your worst. That's smooth. Take and when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Yes. Yes. No. It's four plus one. Four plus one. And David's writing the Psalms. Because he's the stone of Israel. And they say Goliath had four brothers, which we know that. He's not interested in them. You see, it isn't death that's going to get... It isn't cancer that kills you. It isn't a car crash that kills you. It's the enemy at work in your life every day that stops you living to the power that Jesus Christ had when he conquered your death. Some people are dead while they're still living. Some people are more alive today than they've ever been because they are dead. Do you understand? It is the death, the death that's impregnated the whole of society. And I find myself, you know, I told you, Tessa Jowell, she looks such a, oh, what a shame she's dead. And I said to her, I mustn't say what a shame Tessa Jowell was dead. She may well have been a believer and she's happier than she's ever been. But we're programmed to think, oh, my word, it's terrible. She's just died. But actually, she might just have gone to her finest day. But the whole of society doesn't want us to talk about death because it's too scary. But look what he says here. He says, David ran over, stood over the Philistine, whose name means banish you. Banish, exile, you away from God. Took his sword, the very thing that would kill you, drew it out of his sheath and killed him. Death, where, oh, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? You know, I said that to that lovely man I kept meeting every day, Dave, you know, um, and then that day I called at his house with you, Carol, knocked on his door and I said, how are you? He said, my dad's just dying, come in. And you and I stood there leaning over this man for two and a half hours till he did go. I've never, I've only ever met him. We'd met him once on a chase and once when he wasn't very well. I, and I, I was on my tiptoes leaning on this man. I had no fear that his death would be without. It was a very horrible cancer that he had. And I know he could have drowned in his own fluid, I know, with his blood. But he didn't, did he, Alec? Yeah. And we stood there, didn't we? And we watched him go. Hallelujah. That is because I, he had given his heart to Jesus. And you see, I'd led Dave to Jesus, hallelujah. Dad gets saved. Dad's ready to go. That wasn't really the day he died. He died a few weeks earlier when he gave his heart to Jesus. This was just collecting the body. 
And then the stinger got stung. The stinger got stung, folks. Do you feel like shouting, hallelujah? There's victory, there's power, there's authority in the name of Jesus. No other name but the name of Jesus. No other name but the name of the Lord. David was, knew this when he wrote Psalm 8. Okay, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, Kelly, when the Philistine, the enemy of you, saw that their champion was dead, what did they do? What does he do? They fled. You, that devil would have you writhing around out there, but the authority. I've got David's sword in my hand. I've got a fence of protection when I'm dealing with you. Not that that worries me. But look, it gets better. Verse 52. The men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted. And look, he's Calvary. Pursued the Philistines as far as the valley. That's Calvary. And to the gates of Ekron. Ekron means uprooting. Uprooting. That's what David did that day. He uprooted that spirit of death. And the slain Philistines lay along the way. I'd say that was the way following Christ. To Sharaim. Remember what we said Sharaim means? Two gates. Two gates. The decision. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Broad is the gate that we leads to destruction. So we said here, it's, it means... Sharim, two gates, from the root sher, S-H-E-R, meaning to separate or to estimate. It's in the presence of your enemy that you are separated and estimated. You estimate your Christian good standing in health today by the way you deal with your enemies. And if you're like me, your enemy, your thoughts, your mind will come to you morning Evening, night, as we've just looked in the Psalms. But there's always a full day when the sun shines so bright and the big pit that the devil has dug is for him to go in and no one else. That's right. With Doeg, in the play, in the, with Doeg fearful. Have a look at this. And the slain Philistines lay along the way to separation and estimation, even to Gath, the wine press, an Ekron. You see, the wine press is the rooting out. Well, it will be the rooting out of every one of God's enemies. And that's why Isaiah said, Who is this who's just rooted out all of God's enemies? The God of the, the Jews. But have a look at this. Verse 53 The sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their camps. Then David took the Philistine's head, death, death, and brought it to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. But he put his weapons in his tent. Now look at this. Only then does this question take place. Saul did know who David was. He tried to kill him with a spear. He got no regard for him. Now when Saul, the flesh, saw David, the anointed of the spirit, going out against the Philistine, one who rolls in the dust, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? It's God's son. God's son. Because Abner means father of light. How does that happen? How can it be random, brothers and sisters? I read it to you in the Hebrew in that way. When David returned from killing the fine Philistine, the, no, when it says, when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to the father of the light, the commander of the army, father of light, whose son is this young man? Isn't that wonderful? Father of light, whose son is this? So the son is now connected to a father of light. And Abner, father of light, said, by your life, O king. Here we go, Rodney. This is one that could confuse you. I do not know. And the king said, you inquire whose son the youth is. So when David returned, remember this is after the defeat of Goliath that could banish you. 
When David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner, father of light, took him and brought him before Saul the flesh with the Philistine's head in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I've just killed Goliath. This is Armageddon. Hello, my darling. Thank you for the flowers. I love them. David answered, look what he says. I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the living God, who has wealth and substance, the Bethlehemite. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvelous? Not until the head of Goliath is brought to Jerusalem. It's in the very hand that Saul, the flesh, has to look again. And he turns and he says, whose son is that young man? Can you see that? But the man, he asked, why does God put the man there called father of light who sent his son, his beloved David, into the earth? And then David can turn around and say, whose son are you flesh? Today would say, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your... This is where he brings in Jesse. I am the son, but Jesse means of the living God. I am the son of the living God who defeated Goliath, who wanted to banish me from being near to him forevermore. But I have defeated. Now, have a look at this, Rodney, if you're not altogether confused. 1 Samuel 18. Jonathan and David become friends. You see, these are the people who are going to join themselves to the one who is the son of the living God, whose father is light. No, surely this is the son of God. Mm. Yes. No, Jesse, Jesse, the word Jesse in Hebrew means um, the living God of wealth and substance. Now, don't forget you've got ancient and modern Hebrew, but that's what the ancient Hebrew people say. Jesse being brought up here is to say, Jesse, the living God, comma, of wealth and substance. But when you look at this in typology, it's marvellous, isn't it? Do you think it is? Yeah. We've got a head to shake, brothers and sisters, and it's the head of death that Jesus Christ in his death defeated him who had the power to banish us from the Father's presence. And that's what the glory of Psalm 8 is all about. But isn't it great? Not until the world is going to see the victory when the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the pit, Satan's left for the thousand years. You see, it's not until the great victory is seen that the flesh people left upon the earth are going to turn and say, whose son are you? And our beloved David will say, I am the son of the living God of wealth and substance, the Bethlehemite, the house of bread, where I was born. Amen. Hallelujah. Then Jonathan and David became friends. It came about when he had finished speaking to flesh, Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. And Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Um, so if you may be, you may think you've got lost, you haven't. If you just go back to Psalm, do you know that's? I want to challenge you, uh, Kelly. The, the entrance of God's word brings light, and you, I keep looking at it and looking at it, and I've worn the pages out looking at it. I am the Son of the Living God. I've got your death in my hand, Julie. I am the Son of the Living God of wealth and substance. I am the fa I'm associated with the Father, not until he's killed, not until he's defeated all his enemies. But so we go back to Psalm chapter 1. It's all right, we're finishing now. We've been going for an hour, okay? I just want to show you something. Have you written that second song? Did you... Thousands of birthdays in, in his glory. Then I put eternal morning. 
Isn't that wonderful? Is that, is that on Facebook? Yeah. I haven't been on yet today. No, it's, it's eternal, eternal morning. Yeah. Yes, you've got it. Yeah. It's beautiful. I am delighted. I'm delighted, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. If we just go back, book one is how blessed is the man. And we said that, didn't we? Yeah. We're going to finish this off, by the way, on Sunday. So, you, so book one finishes, um, sorry, Psalm 1 finishes with verse 6. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. That's the separation and the estimation that's seen of the double gates of Sharim with David and Goliath. When our David comes, there'll be those who are for him and those who are against him. But because he's speaking of this, if you put an arrow, he's got to then follow on to Psalm 2 when he's saying, Israel are not ready. Look, verse 1, the nations are in an uproar. The peoples are devising a vain thing. So book 1 is six verses split into two sets of three. One to three is speaking of Christ and the remnant of Israel. But four to six is speaking about the wicked. So when you get to verse two, um, sorry, Psalm two, think of the wrong government again. So how many verses has Psalm two got to have, Rodney? It's got to have, because this is the end of a satanic antichrist government. Plotting. He sets, it, he sets it up in Psalm 1. In Psalm 2, and we will do this on Sunday, that it's the manifest government of Antichrist spirit. Amen. Twelve verses. So then you start, you see, it's told you at the end, look, of verse 12, you've got an opportunity. Do homage to the Son during the tribulation, lest he become angry and you perish in the way during the tribulation, for his wrath during the tribulation may soon be kindled. Well, it's going to be kindled when he comes seven times brighter than the sun. How blessed are all you. So there's still an opportunity during the tribulation who take refuge in him and is speaking all under that satanic government. So then this is why it starts off with a messianic psalm. Chapter three is known as a messianic psalm. Speaking about how the, look, verse one, this is called your morning and look what's happening. Do you know what he's saying, Rodney? How blessed are all who take refuge in him. And David then goes on, look, and he says here, look what he says. Oh, Lord, this is the end of the age for Israel. How my adversaries have increased. Has Israel got more enemies today or less? Many are rising up against me. I'd say the BBC, CBA, everything. Everyone is right. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. Selah. But look what he says. This touches the heart of the Father. This is a messianic psalm. But thou, O Lord, art a shield about me, my glory in the one who lifts my head. Think of Psalm 22. I was crying to the Lord with my voice. He answered me from his holy mountain, Selah. Now look what he says. You see, this David knew some peace. I lay down and slept. I woke for the Lord sustains me. And then he says, and anyone, any of the old writers say, the trials will get so much worse before the full day of eight for this remnant of Israel. So he says here, I lay down and slept. I woke. He's teaching them to trust. There'll be a remnant being taught to sleep because he will sustain them. Then he, the, this is what Israel will say in Petra where we're going next year. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me round about. Then he says, oh, arise, O oh Lord, save me, O oh my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies on the cheek. Thou hast shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. 
the blessings be upon thy people. Selah. Then just look at verse 4, finishing there. The choir director on stringed instruments. The, the songs begin. And this is a psalm for the faint-hearted. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear and my prayer. This is of Christ and the remnant of Israel. Just turn the page over for a moment. And we said, didn't we? Look in Psalm 5, we said, was the evening psalm. Things are getting worse. And the flute is brought in. Sadness. But we wonder why this again is the ungodly government. Because there are, as we said, 12 verses. If you are thinking I use the Psalms, so do I, and I have done for 36 years, to find prayers to say to God or whatever. But when does a Christian ever say this in verse 4 and 5? For thou art not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with thee. The boastful shall not stand before thine eyes. Thou dost hate all who do iniquity. Thou dost destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. These aren't anything to do with Christians because we can never pray that prayer. We can never turn around in this day of grace and say, thou dost hate all who do iniquity because God does not hate all who do iniquity. He's longing for them to be saved. Yeah. So this is how if you try and explain to somebody this is talking about an earthly people during the most terrible times of their life. And can you kind of get a sense today of uh, how you can see it um, coming from one to eight. Lie down and sleep. Begin to know me because your days are going to become terrible. I thought the other day of Revelation 9 where a third of mankind is wiped out. A third of mankind dies when they come out of the pit, the demons. And then we think of the third that escapes of Israel. It is, it's all this uh, numbers, isn't it? Now, this is the bit where the, where the tune goes down. Chapter 6, we're finishing. Prayer for mercy in time of trouble is on the word, if you've got an A-V, it means Sheminith, S-H-E-M-I-N-I-T-H. And it says, look, for the choir director with stringed instruments upon an eight-string lyre, a psalm of David, Play it an octave below. That's what it means. Play it an octave below. And when you get low music, what does it generally mean? Sadness, sorrow. Mm -hmm. Look what he says, one and two. O Lord, do not rebuke me in thine anger. This will be the remnant of Israel. Nor chasten me in thy... Now, what is the wrath? It's the tribulation. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am pining away. Can you see that? Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are dismayed and my soul is greatly dismayed. But thou, O Lord, and look, this is what Israel will say. How long? How long will these 42 months go on? Return, O Lord, rescue my soul and then save me. Why? Because of thy loving kindness. These flutes... This is where they find Israel at rock bottom. Look at this, verse 5. There is no mention of thee in death, in Sheol who will give thee thanks. This is the valley of the shadow of death in Psalm 23. Look what they say. I am weary with my sighing. Every night I make my bed swim. I dissolve my couch with my tears. My eye has wasted away with grief. It has become old because of all my adversaries. Depart from me, all you who do iniquity. For the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord receives my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly dismayed. They shall turn back. They shall suddenly be dismayed. Then seven is the night. And again, it was Cush. 
and just go these two verses, one and two. O Lord my God, in thee I have taken... Our refuge, we're saying, is in the location of Petra, Bosra, the sheepfold, David the shepherd, put the stones in his sling, speaking of the same thing. Save me from all those who pursue me and deliver me. And this is the card, Alec, today. Lest he tear my soul like a lion. He says, there's a lion outside dragging me away while there is none to deliver. That is the tribulation. Can you see that? I can, can you? Then you turn the page over, as we've said. You go right down to the bottom. And look what they say, verse 11. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. Remember, he's coming with a two-edged sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons he makes his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, he travails with wickedness and he conceives mischief, brings forth falsehood. He has dug a pit, hollowed it out, fallen into the hole which he made. His mischief will return upon his own head. His violence will descend upon his own pate. I give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Then, hallelujah, you've got the full day of Psalm chapter 8. And David, for the choir director, on the Gittith, the wine press, think Gath, think Goliath, think Ekron, rooting out finally every one of David's enemies. Every one of David's enemies were your enemies. Every one of Christ's enemies today are my enemies. Everyone, does God want good for mankind? Yes, he did and sent his son. So we need to know we're praying in the will of God. But it's God's will to bless. It's God's will to show mercy. It's God's will to care. And that's why in the Psalms you can see these are terrible days coming. And then, uh, Rodney, when you go look to chapter 9. So, okay, we have finished 9. When it says, Muth Labbing, can you see that on the heading? It starts again. It's finished there. How majestic is the name on the earth. And now you start again. Because this is called death for the sun. Muthlabin is death for the sun. So it starts all over again, Rodney. Because it can't take you beyond the entrance of the Most High God into the millennial reign. And then you see here with this, there are 10 Hebrew letters. But the only one that's missing is the Dalit which is the door. So again, you start with men who haven't found the door into the entrance to eternal life yet. So that was just to make a start. Um, just to make... What's the matter, Alison? It's just to make a kind of start here, but I've done more Psalms in there um, than... Um, but d brothers and sisters... It's glorious, isn't it? Fresh as a daisy. <laughs> can you see? Can you see? Can you see? When you see history, history is prophecy. When David's the right one to write Psalm 8, morning, evening, night, full day, happens to be the eighth Psalm before they start all over again with the people who haven't found I am the door, I am the gate for the sheep. So, Lord, we, we go home and... Um, <laughs> Lord, Lord, I, I don't want to remove a landmark. I don't want to go past anything. 